Namaste. So let's just continue uh, with the next verse, verse 10. Objection. The sense objects are perceived in dreams just the same as in the waking state. How then do you adduce their difference on the ground that the organs do not function then? Reply. Listen. There are no chariots nor animals to be yoked to them, nor roads there, but he creates the chariots, animals, and roads. There are no pleasures, joys, or delights there, but he creates the pleasures, joys, and delights. There are no pools, tanks, or rivers there, but he creates the pools, tanks, and rivers, for he is the agent. Shankaracharya's purport. There are no objects such as chariots there in dreams, nor are there animals to be yoked to them, such as horses, nor roads for the chariots. But he himself creates the chariots, animals, and roads. But how does he create them, since there are no trees, etc., which are the means of the chariots, and so forth? The reply is being given. It has been said in paragraph 9, He takes away a little of this all-embracing world, himself puts the body aside, and himself creates. The modifications of the mind are a little of this world, that is, are its impressions. The former detaching the latter, in other words, being transformed into the impressions of chariots, etc., and being stimulated by the individual's previous work, which is the cause of their perception, appear as the sense objects. This is expressed by the words, and himself creates, and also by the clause, he creates the chariots, etc. Really, there are neither activities of the organs nor lights such as the sun that help them, nor objects such as the chariots to be illumined by them but only their impressions are visible, having no existence apart from the palpable modifications of the mind that are stimulated by the individual's previous work, which is the cause of the perception of those impressions. The light with constant vision that witnesses them, the light of the self, is perfectly isolated in this state, like a sword separated from its sheath. So the key here is the phrase, he becomes the agent. In other words, the self himself creates these things by imagination, by projection, by the creation of an upadi, a layer of something superimposed on what is there. And in the case of dreams, what is there is only the mind. There's no body, no senses, and no world to be perceived by them. There is only the mind, which is nothing but an accumulation of impressions, thoughts, basically, images, memories. So if all these things are utilized, one can create or imagine any kind of a world. And indeed, we see in dreams crazy things happen that could never happen in Jagrat reality. Instead, what happens is that according to our past work, our karma, different memories come up and different desires impel us to create certain experiences for ourselves. Now, the perfect expression of this, well, there are two actually. In creative work, when one is creating new artwork or something like that, and in bhakti, when one imagines a relationship with the Supreme. So in both of these cases, one creates something that was not there before, although one uses pieces, huh, the impressions of previous experiences. Yet the creation that one uh, makes by imagination is not something that ever existed before. Originality, creativity. Huh? And in bhakti, uh, 
The individual, every individual, has a unique relationship with God. God becomes a symbol, a metaphor, which also serves to adjust the individual to the circumstances in which he finds himself, because none of us has a perfect life. We all have things that are missing, things that we would like to be able to do or have or see or experience, but due to circumstances, we can't. So to adjust to this state of affairs, the individual uses the symbol of God, who has unlimited creative powers, to create a world and a relationship in which all these deficiencies of his life become adjusted and satisfied. In psychology, this is called compensation. And it's vital that we use these facilities to overcome the inevitable neuroses of living in an imperfect world, where the situation that we're born into is not one of our choosing, and basically the conditions of our environment are forced upon us, and we have to deal with them not having chosen them, but being responsible for the results. This is the uh, existential criteria of human existence in the material world. So <laughs> in order to counteract this, in order to create a medicine for it, a cure for it, a counterbalance that adjusts for this situation, both artistic imagination and bhakti are there to create alternative realities and having an alternative reality is great as long as one is perfectly aware of the distinction and does not try to mix the alternative reality with the Jagrat reality. Because Svapna and Jagrat operate by different rules. You cannot have the same freedom of expression, of imagination, and of action in Jagrat that you do in Svapna, because Svapna is limited to yourself alone. It is not imposed on anyone else. But in the material world, we see people doing this all the time, taking their own reality, their own value system, their own impressions, their own preferences, and so on, and projecting them on others, projecting them on the world, as it were trying to make a dent in reality, as one famous CEO has said, as a motivation for his activities, which are sometimes, you know, pretty mean, pretty nasty. So the justification of changing the world or creating a dent in reality uh, motivates selfish people to project their own dreams on everybody else as far as possible. Uh, in the material world, our creative potency is limited. But in the dream world, it's not. Because we can have an intimate relationship with God who has all creativity, all power, all resources, and so forth. <laughs> so this is a nice... Facility. This is, an, this is a wonderful thing, actually. And we find that artists, especially the ones who understand this and realize that their art, their creativity, uh, is not an excuse to try to force their views on others, but who take responsibility and own their unique fantasies and simply uh, present them as uh, art objects to share if you enjoy it, that's great. If not, you know, click to the next video or whatever. <laughs> so actually, this is a pretty good system. And art and artists have existed throughout recorded history and probably will continue to exist because of this fact of human existence that we are not comfortable in the world of Jagrat. There's always something missing, and the Buddha perfectly described it. He said, it's anicca 
dukkha anatta, which means impermanent, imperfect, and not self. <laughs> That's the problem in Jagrat. But in Svapna, it's not a problem because we are there and we are eternal. Everything we imagine in that world is perfect because it's just suited to our specific situation and needs. And it is self because it is the vision of the self, the light of the self, filtered through our desires and our past activities and so on. Likewise, there are no pleasures, kinds of happiness, joys such as those caused by the birth of a son, etc., or delights, which are those very joys magnified. But he creates the pleasures, etc. Likewise, there are no pools, tanks, or rivers there, but he creates the pools, etc., in the form of impressions only, for he is the agent. We have already said that his agency consists in merely being the cause of the work that generates the modifications of the mind representing those impressions. Direct activity is then out of the question, for there are no means. Activity is impossible without its factors. In dreams, there cannot be any factors of an action, such as hands and feet. But in the waking state, when they are present, the body and organs, illumined by the light of the self, perform work that later on produce the modifications of the mind representing the impressions of the chariot, etc., Hence it is said, for he is the agent. This has been stated in the passage, it is through the light of the self that he sits, goes out, works, and returns, in verse 6. There too, strictly speaking, the light of the self has no direct agency except that it is the illuminer of everything. The light of the self, which is pure intelligence, illumines the body and organs through the mind, and they perform their functions being illumined by it. Hence, in the passage quoted, the agency of the self is merely figurative. What has been stated in the passage, it thinks, as it were, and shakes, as it were, in verse 7, is here repeated in the clause, for he is the agent, in order to furnish a reason. This is subtle. Pay attention. In other words, in dreams, we appear or the self appears to be the creator. But actually, he's not an agent. He's only the illuminer. The actual agent, so-called, you know, as it were, <laughs> is the intelligence. The intelligence working with the already existing impressions from past experiences and the karmic results of past work, which incline one towards certain desires and experiences, creates these experiences in the form of dreams. But, now this is a very important distinction, these activities witnessed by the self do not create karma. Why? Because there is no means for them to actually occur. There's no body, no organs, no senses, no muscles or no tools, no resources, no objects. Nothing of Jagrat exists in that world except impressions. So everything in the dream world is only impressions and carries absolutely no karmic result with it. In other words, you can dream or imagine anything you want, and there's no repercussions, there's no consequences, no karma from that. Whereas if you work doing the same things in Jagrat, there are consequences due to the law of karma. That's because nothing in this world is really ours. Nothing in this world belongs to the self. It all ultimately is a function of maya. 
And she is everything. Therefore, she controls everything. She owns everything. It's her property. So when we perform an action in the material world with material body and organs and senses and material tools and objects and resources, we are dealing with energy of Maya, energy of the goddess. Therefore, you know, there is a tax on it. The tax is called karma, that these actions become a cause of further actions in the next life. So in other words, the difference between waking and dreaming is that there's no karma in dreaming. Otherwise, everything else is open for us to try to imagine and work with and impose our will upon in dreams without any consequence whatsoever. Now, of course, the reality is <laughs> that what we dream tends to become our experience in waking life and in the next life, certainly. Why is that? Because we are Brahman. We are, on one level, the creator. Everyone who has cultivated any kind of art or craft uh, or constructed anything or created any original work knows the pleasure of bringing one's dreams into reality or bringing one's swapna into one's jagrat. And of course, the thing about that is, in jagrat, we share these things with others and it has impacts on them, which also cause consequences. Therefore, as Lao Tzu said, <laughs> One's every word echoes to the distance of 10,000 miles. One must certainly be careful. Therefore, we, as sadhus, as followers of the Vedas, and especially of Advaita, try to mold our activities in such a way that they impact people the least and do not result in any karmic consequences. For example, just talking about how the self is the actual reality doesn't hurt anybody. You know, we're not forcing anyone to listen to this. If they don't like it, they can click on to the next video or whatever. That's fine. And the same in our everyday activities in life. We don't try to impose our views or understanding or ways of life on others because we do not want to have karmic results in the next life. We want to be liberated. The best way to manage this is to only deal in subject matter in relation to liberation. And in this way, we bring into reality the dream of being free from karma, free from cause and effect. And the only way to do that, really, is to give up the idea of our agency. But in any case, if we identify with Brahman, there is no agency, because Brahman is simply the watcher, the witness. Brahman is not the doer. That's mind and intelligence operating through the body and the senses in the world. So by intelligence, we can understand we're not the doer, we're not the agent, but we are simply uh, going through the fruits of our karma that we created in previous lives. Ramana Maharshi talks about this a lot. He says, the liberated soul, the jnani, one who is understanding his actual nature is Brahman and that everything is Brahman. Huh? Everyone is already Brahman. Most people don't recognize it. Most people don't understand it. But that doesn't change the fact that that's what they are.
And since the nature of a thing cannot be separated from the thing itself, the intrinsic attributes or qualities of a thing are, you know, part and parcel of that thing. So the nature of Brahman is to not be an agent, to not be a doer. The reason for this is that as Brahman is all knowledge, all consciousness, and all bliss and all existence, that cannot be separated. That knowledge, that consciousness of everything cannot be separated from Brahman. So any desire that Brahman might have, which is a purely speculative matter because Brahman doesn't desire either. <laughs> and the reason Brahman doesn't desire is that any desire that it could have is already satisfied. Because Brahman is also all possibilities. So thus, Brahman is never an agent, never a doer, has no need to be an actor, uh, is simply the watcher, the witness, the awareness, the objectless awareness. Uh, why do we say objectless? Because sarva kalvidang brahma. There is nothing but Brahman. Everything is Brahman. So if everything is Brahman, even if Brahman sees apparent material objects, it sees them as itself. So for Brahman, there is no object. There is only itself. And that is what is meant by objectless awareness. It is not that when one becomes Brahman realized that the whole world disappears. It disappears as an object, as a world. But it continues to be manifest and perceptible as Brahman, as one's self. This is the experience of the jnani. This is the experience of the jivan mukta. That he is watching this vision, this mirage, huh? this hallucination <laughs> caused by maya, which is beginningless, inexplicable, and incomprehensible. <laughs> In other words, she does whatever she wants. <laughs> and not really involved with it at all. Only being the watcher. So the karma for this life is already set up in previous lives. All one has to do is allow it to expire. Allow it to bear its fruits and disappear. And then when it's all used up, you're finished. That's liberation. So liberation is actually already attained the moment one realizes, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And well, then why do we keep going on and on with these detailed teachings about consciousness and so forth? Well, for two reasons, maybe three. <laughs> one who knows that I am Brahman also then knows that everybody else is Brahman and everything else is Brahman. Therefore, he's not really interested anymore in the outcomes of the situations in the material world, in Jagrat. He views Jagrat, the world and the people and things in it, as just another dream. Why? Because like dreams at, at night in Svapna, it's temporary. Everything changes. Everything ultimately goes away. So then why should we be so concerned about it unless we're identified with Jagrat? But that's Maya. Huh? That is the illusion. That's what keeps people in suffering. So if one is free from that, one simply observes it and also observes one's mind and thoughts and dreams, which are the contents of the mind, 
in Svapna consciousness in the same detached way. And then, of course, we see Sushupti consciousness as the ignorance that keeps us from seeing everything as it actually is. So uh, we see how that is working in ordinary life, for example, uh, when we try to concentrate on a particular task. When we concentrate on doing something, you know, like in a few minutes, I'm going to edit this video. And when I get into it, I forget all about the world. I forget, you know, how I am sitting in the chair in my room, in my office, with my computer. I forget all about that. And I simply concentrate on, oh, I have to cut here. Oh, I have to move this and so on. I don't think about so many things that I'm normally aware of. And this is ignorance. Call it selective ignorance if you like. But what we're really doing is we're using sushupti, consciousness of nothing, to cover those things so that we don't have to be aware of them and we can concentrate on our chosen task. So <laughs> this is the reality. And if you are actually in Brahman, you can see this. It's just obvious. And, of course, that also means there is no need for graduated instructions in the different states of consciousness or what to speak of uh, religious or spiritual rites or yoga practices or meditation or whatever. Yet, the Jivan Mukta, it is seen, acts out of compassion to present What's in the scriptures, the guidance that's given, the revelations that make us aware of the actual situation? He likes to see others enhance their well-being through the teachings of the scriptures. And so he makes those teachings available, shares them, and tries to explain to people how to be free so that they don't have to suffer. See, and that is also akarma or naish karma, meaning it does not create karmic results. Why is that? Because it's knowledge in relation with liberation. See, most so called knowledge is just information about the world and objects and work and stuff like that, karma and whatever, in the world. So we reject that knowledge because that is karmic knowledge. That is material knowledge. That is knowledge under the aegis of cause and effect. I can't help using these fancy words sometimes. I'm sorry. It's just that they say exactly what I'm trying to express at the moment. Anyway, I'll try to keep my vocabulary more simple. But anyhow, what people see others doing, including they see jivan muktas like this too, that they see that we are actors, that we are agents, and that we are trying to accomplish something in the world by sharing these teachings. And indeed, many people who claim to be spiritual teachers are trying to establish or maintain or expand organizations, um, bring in more income, gain more power, more leverage, more influence in the world, and so on. Uh, but an actually liberated soul doesn't want any part of these kind of activities because they're all generators of karma. If one simply drops all other activities, except maybe for meditation, you know, uh, in diving deep into the ocean of Brahman, <laughs> because that's just a pure pleasure. Uh, so if one drops all other external activities and simply works out of compassion to help mankind, to help uh, human life in general, 
to increase its quality of experience on this world, then there's no karma generated and hence no compromise of the liberated status. And that's why uh, Jivan Muktas in general become sannyasis and they give up everything and they, you know, don't even wear clothes. <laughs> that is just the nature of that state of being, that state of consciousness. And that is the reality that is free from suffering and which we are all trying to attain. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.